Namaskar. Ami ekhani shontushto. Amarke amontro janna no jotno apna ke tomobad. When I was at sea last August on my voyage to this country, on inspecting the observations of the day that India lay before us and Persia on our left, whilst a breeze from Arabia blew nearly on our stern, it gave me inexpressible pleasure to find myself in the midst of so noble an amphitheatre, almost encircled by the vast regions of Asia. I could not help remarking how important and extensive a field was yet unexplored, and when I considered with pain that such inquiries and improvements could only be made by the united efforts of so many who are not easily brought to converge in a common point, I consoled myself with a hope founded on opinions which it might have the appearance of flattery to mention that if in any country or community such a union could be effected, it was in Bengal. These are the words, of course, of Sir William Jones in his first discourse to the Asiatic Society in, on the 15th of February, 1784. And again. A little under five months after his marriage to Anna Maria Shipley, a daughter of the Bishop of St. Asaph in North Wales, Sir William Jones and his new bride made landfall in India on the 2nd of September, 1783. They were carried ashore at Madras in the arms of Tamil boatmen from the small frigate HMS Crocodile. If you go again. The Joneses were in India for Sir William to take up office as a judge of His Majesty's Supreme Court of Judicature at Fort William, Calcutta, in Bengal Presidency. And so a couple of days later, they set sail again on the final leg of the journey up the coast from Madras to this city of palaces. Sorry, if we go on one more. Um, this is, uh, sorry, St. Asaph. And then if we go on again, uh, one more. <laughs> this is the, uh, I'm afraid, the wreck of the crocodile. The, the, the ship sank uh, when it, on, on the return journey. Um, during the five-month voyage, Sir William had been furthering his studies in Persian law. He was already conversant with Roman, Greek, and Arabian legal history, and his friend Edward Gibbon, author of the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, considered Sir William to be a genius. Before Jones arrived in Calcutta, uh, Warren Hastings, the Governor General of Bengal, had been encouraging accomplished British linguists to make translations from Indian texts. Most notable of these was the translation of the uh, Bhagavad Gita by Charles Wilkins. Um, if you move on again, and there was also the uh, famous grammar of Bengal by Hollinshed. Uh, with, uh, with a small circle of men like Wilkins already in place, on the 15th of January, 1784, less than 16 weeks after his arrival in Calcutta, uh, Jones founded the Asiatic Society, um, and again, uh, which of course knows, need, no, needs no introduction here, uh, with the aim of inquiring into the history, civil and natural, the antiquities, arts, sciences, and literature of Asia. From here, in a way, my own story begins. In uh, 2011, I, like Sir William Jones, a Welshman educated in England, and um, like his wife, uh, the offspring of a Bishop of St. Asaph, if you go on a couple of, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, um, I made my first visit to the Asiatic Society on Park Street in the heart of Calcutta and to the Indian Museum. At the Asiatic Society, I viewed a number of the inscribed copper plates that uh, embody gifts of land by rulers of Bengal to Brahminical communities. If we go on again. Um, 
Records of the gift of land are the major source both for the historian of early Bengal and of medieval Scotland alike. By contrast with many other countries, this type of evidence, whether it be in copper or stone as it is in India, or on parchment or stone as it is in the British Isles, is central to debates about the growth of royal authority, the development of government, and its relation to people on the land. For Scotland between the 11th and 13th centuries, charters in the broadest sense of that term are the largest category of historical source, and Bengal's early medieval history relies heavily on its copper plate charters, as it were, too. If we go on to the next. A charter, in general terms, I would define as a written record of the conveyance of property or rights issued by a donor or the guaranteeing authority. In the medieval West, charters were usually written in the Latin language, in ink on parchment. The parchment being, of course, untanned skin from sheep, calves, or goats. And in the earliest charter from Scotland here, the King of Scots gives several villages to a community of Christian monks as a charitable gift, with legal privileges and freedom from taxes, for the benefit of his soul and his parents' souls, guaranteed by religious sanctions. And the document was written by a scribe who identifies himself by name. Uh, his name is Grenz. It was not until that first visit to Kolkata in 2011 that I realized records of a very similar type from the same time existed in India. Of course, in the Indian Museum here, along with the Asiatic Society and the West Bengal State Archaeological Museum, um, there are many copper plate inscriptions from early medieval Bengal in the collections. And it was on visiting the Museum of the Asiatic Society, in fact, that I had my first encounter with a display of such uh, copper plates. If we move on. Now, this one, of course, is actually from the, um, the archaeological museum in Bihala. Uh, although the medium of record is quite different uh, from the Scottish context, the records from early medieval Bengal are, uh, are made in the Sanskrit language, of course, and inscribed on copper, or as we know, sometimes stone. The content, nevertheless, has striking parallels. In this example, in a similar way to the Scottish records, one finds a king giving a village to a Brahmin as a charitable gift with legal privileges and freedom from taxes for the eternal merit of his parents and himself. And the gift was guaranteed by religious sanctions and the text inscribed by an engraver who identified himself by name. I think we go on again. But more than this, not only were the terms of the transfer of property similar, but the very language used is closely related. And here we come back to the importance of Bengal and Kolkata in particular. The Asiatic Society in Kolkata, founded, as, I, as, as we know, uh, in 1784, fostered and promoted the notion of an Indo-European family of languages. Um, this was a notion which uh, Sir William Jones talked about, I think, in his, his third address, his third annual address. And the family of, relate, this is the family of related languages that today are widely spoken uh, in, in, in the Americas, Europe, and also Western and Southern Asia. And it's this Indo-European linguistic theory which in some way illustrates my theme. In Sanskrit, the word for the method of giving as a gift is dana, and in Latin, the same Indo-European root provides the noun donum, gift, and the verb dono, I give. And it's the concept of transferring ownership of property by giving as a gift, using a word which has the same origin in Sanskrit and Latin that is alike at the heart of the property records both from Bengal and Scotland. Now, in 
2013, a well-known and distinguished historian of medieval England called Susan Reynolds, a, a particular expert on feudalism and a fellow of the British Academy, no less, delivered a plea to an audience in Delhi for historians of early medieval India to make comparisons with early medieval Europe. But I was already on the case. Now, scholars with a combined knowledge of Sanskrit, Latin, and a developed understanding of the charter form are scarce. But I came to find out that the one person who had done any work making a direct comparison of Indian copper plates with European charters was Professor Shrapna Bhattacharya of the University of Calcutta. And if we move on, um, in a chapter uh, of her University of Heidelberg PhD thesis published in German in 1985, Professor Bhattacharya had compared a 9th century copper plate from Bengal with a 9th century charter from Germany. An introduction to Professor Bhattacharya was facilitated by the then Vice Chancellor of the University of Calcutta, Professor Shuranjan Das, and a fruitful collaboration ensued um, and we decided to merge specialist knowledge, and so Professor Bhattacharya with Professor uh, Shushandra Ghosh, Dr. Shantani Pal, Dr. Rajat Sanyal at the University of Calcutta worked with me, Professor David Brun, Dr. Catherine Forsyth, and if you move on again, uh, Dr. Sheeminis and Ms. Joanna Tucker from the University of Glasgow Center for Scottish and Celtic Studies in the School of Humanities. And through two workshops funded by a grant from the British Academy, one in Glasgow in September 2014, and the other in uh, Kolkata uh, on, in April 2015, we discussed our respective sources and methods. Now, if you go on one more. Now, the Scottish Kingdom from the 9th to the 13th centuries, contemporary with the later Indian early Middle Ages, is an especially apt comparator because it has charters and later on panegyric poetry, although surviving in different contexts, to compare with the copper plate inscriptions and their integral prashastis from early medieval Bengal. And if we move on again, I think Wales and Ireland would be the only other places to offer something similar. But in Scotland alone do we have this well-developed charter tradition, and that's our chief point of interest and comparison. As well as offering new ways of thinking about uh, the relationship between charters, panegyric, and genealogy, the copper plate inscriptions of Bengal have the potential to add a fresh understanding of parchment charters as artifacts, not just as texts. And epigraphy being a significant source for Bengal is also important in a Scottish context with a large corpus of early medieval inscribed stones, including potential evidence for property transfer and genealogy directly associated with land. Because land transfer in both regions was closely related to royal prerogative and royal legitimacy, understanding the records leads to questions about the evolution of royal authority and the formation of kingdoms. Our British Academy funded project then was intended to be an instrument, instrumental in developing new thinking, practices, paradigms, and audiences for work on records of property transfer in South Asia by viewing the sources as legal, political, and literary texts in a field once dominated by Marxist models of feudalism. As historians of Scotland on our side, We've been wishing to learn about the interplay of dynastic propaganda and written instruments of government. Panegyric is always separate from charters in Scotland, but the two are combined in the Bengal context. The role of fragile parchment as a permanent record for property transfer compared with the durable copper plates and epigraphy of Bengal is another point of potentially informative contrast. In this way, we can take the copper plate inscriptions of Bengal as a means of bringing together things that in Scotland are chronologically and culturally disparate. 
In both cases, we've been aiming to understand the rights and powers a ruler had over a subject's lands and how possession of land related to administration of the law. First of all, our work has confirmed that genuinely close parallels exist between records of property transfer in both contexts. Early Bengal and Scotland are two societies without any immediate contacts or shared influence. Nevertheless, both have this markedly similar range of textual ways of expressing rulership and landholding. Each has, written each has written records of land, of gifts of land, boundary descriptions, genealogy, and praise poetry. The copper plate inscriptions of Bengal were many faceted texts used in a specific setting to support hereditary religious castes and institutions. In Scotland, charters and inscriptions secured landholding generally while genealogies and praise poems were separately associated with kin or dynasty-based power. In Bengal, the chief sources for studying the development of statehood, the copper plate inscriptions, include gift of land, boundary clause, genealogy, and panegyric in one text. In Scotland, only charters, the records of property transfer, are studied in this light of the development of statehood. Can a new understanding of landholding and growing royal authority be fashioned that would be applicable in both contexts? How significant are cultural means of securing social privilege through text and artifact? We've been looking from an entirely different perspective on the relationship between writing, government, and society and we're hoping to have prepared the ground for an approach that's applicable in different societies with similar kinds of sources which can be pursued more widely, not only in Europe and India, but beyond. So, in all societies based on land and driven by a spiritual motivation of achieving merit, leading to ultimate salvation. Certain features are bound to be common, I suppose. And the practice of kings in ancient India who made gifts of, of land, land that was free from tax, has to be seen in the context of the growing importance of Brahmanas as a social group. Brahmanas, the agents or carriers of knowledge, and at the same time also the practitioners of knowledge, no less important, they became the leading figures to perform the rituals needed in social events for Hindus from birth to death. And Brahmanas were also in great demand to write eulogies, prashastis, which were perhaps read out at the royal court. And although the caste system was practiced with varying degrees of intensity or rigidity in different parts of India, revering Brahmanas became a general practice followed along the length and breadth of the country. And so the social role of Brahmanas became thus very central, so very central that increasingly the giving of land to them developed as an institution which ultimately led to the practice of issuing edicts embodying the gift engraved upon copper plates. The text of such documents included reference to all related conditions of the gift, dana itself. There's an interesting episode um, cited in, in uh, B.C. Chavra in his uh, Diplomatic of Sanskrit Copper Plate Grants. This offers an insight into the use, the wide use of copper plates for the purpose of donating land to Brahmanas. Bosha, a king from uh, Paramara dynasty, once saw a Brahmana carrying a leather vessel for a water jar. Bosha was surprised to see this and asked the Brahmana the reason. The Brahmana gave a reply which says that iron became rare as it was used to make chains for capturing enemies, and copper became equally rare since it was 
constantly used for making plates for registering donations of land. Now, the word uh, shasana, which has a wide semantic range, including edict, teaching, written text, can simply mean also charter. As in early medieval Europe, the issuing authority was mainly the dynastic ruler. Thus, Raja Shasan, royal charter, almost equals Shasana in general. And DC Silka distinguished three categories, the Dana Shasana, the Prasada Shasana, and the Jaya Patra. The first is the record of gifts, possibly he meant gift in general, the second indicates any kind of favor, and the third relates to the victory of any party in any dispute. Whoever wins the dispute issues the victory deed. In Scotland, we have a similar division of royal acts. First, the donation of property. Secondly, the granting of a favor or privilege. And thirdly, the licensing of an agreement or settlement between disputing parties. Now against this background, uh, DC Silka further described how revenue-free gifts granted by ancient Indian rulers in favor of persons, deities, or religious establishments were usually endowed with a deed engraved on dur durable tam tamrapata. And the words used for copper plate records are often called tamra shasana or tamra pata. And although lands on a massive scale were given to brahmanas in various parts of India, it's in Orissa that several villages are named ending with the word shasana. And Silka uh, further elaborated on the perpetual nature of the gift and public knowledge of it. He took the existence of the practice of issuing copper plate inscriptions back to the third century BCE, for which he cites an inscription um, from uh, Uttar Pradesh. And there are uh, other examples too. Uh, in Bengal, the oldest specimen of such a plate is assigned to 432-433 CE, uh, and this is the uh, Danai Da uh, copper plate inscription of the Gupta Emperor Kumara Gupta. And this is, of course, um, in, in now in modern Bangladesh. And in the case of Bengal, and for that matter, the other parts of India, most donations were made in favor of Brahmanas. The land rights and fiscal privileges that are mentioned in the inscriptions of the Pala Sena period were already well known in northern and central India in the Gupta period, and it's quite probable that the Brahmanas who came from those parts into Bengal were already familiar with such privileges. They probably used their personal influence for promoting the issuing of copper plates containing the same idioms and expressions in order that these privileges be legally sanctioned in Bengal. And in Scotland, the advent of the single sheet Latin charter um, is relatively late too. They, they don't appear until the 11th century, although there's evidence that similar types of document existed from the 9th century. But in the same way, the, 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 only, the earliest surviving single sheet is the one I've already shown you, the one in the middle there, from 1094. But in the same way that Brahminical expertise and knowledge may have influenced developments in Pala, Sena, land grant texts, so the great influx into Great Britain of continentally trained clerics after the Norman conquest of England, the growing influence of the papal courts, seems to have had a significant influence on the development of the charter in Scotland. The copper plates, of course, were issued from the victory camps or royal centers. Um, 
the rulers of various dynasties of early medieval Bengal, especially the Palas, frequently shifted their capitals. And uh, furthermore, uh, linguistic ornamentation and legal precision characterized the royal charters from early medieval Bengal. And such linguistic skill and literary talent speak for the scholarship of the writer of the writers of the inscriptions. And expressed through the inscriptions is also a vigorous justification for legitimacy to rule and for making the donation. And such a development indicates that the legal value of these inscriptions issued under the auspices of kings increased steadily from the 8th century CE onwards. So let's now turn to some specific examples of uh, copper plates from Bengal. Uh, I think if you move on one, uh, and this is one from the British Museum. If you move on again, uh, this is another one from the, the Munga copper plate of Devapala, uh, which is, I think, the first to, uh, to be discovered. Um, uh, and it, or at least the first to come to the notice of European scholars. And the text of this grant with English translation was first published in the Asiatic Researches in the first volume by Charles Wilkin in, in 1788. And this particular text carries typical features common in charters from early medieval Bengal. And in our forthcoming publication, uh, Professor Shwapna Bhattacharya has written a new translation of of this inscription. Now the first part constitutes a genealogy and panegyric, the prashasti. And in the case of Bengal charties, charters, precisely in our, our example of the Mungir charter, we see that the great achievements of uh, Gopala and Tarampala, grandfather and father of Devapala, uh, find a description uh, we learn from, we learn that uh, Dharmapala married Rana Devi, the princess from the uh, Rastakuta, uh, Rastrakuta dynasty. Like oysters producing pearls and gems, Rana Devi, a praiseworthy and devoted wife, gave birth to a son, Devapala Dev, of pleasing countenance. Devapala was compared with the Buddha and was praised for his restrained speech. He is described as having inherited the peaceful kingdom that he so, uh, 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 that he uh, it so brilliantly ruled. And it deserves to be mentioned here that during the reign of Devapala, Bengal uh, it experienced a renaissance in Buddhism. Now, if we move on again, I think. Now, texts, texts that trace the ancestry of a notable individual generation by generation, as the Prashastis do, um, survive in their hundreds from the medieval Gaelic world, the Irish-speaking world, which covers Ireland and parts of Scotland. Uh, such genealogies have been, and such genealogies have been characterized as socio-cultural instruments devised to serve social ends. These ends being title, inheritance, status in church, and secular society. There's then a potential overlap here with charters as records of landholding and lordship, and with panegyric poetry praising a patron's position power and prestige. Genealogy, charter and praise poetry, as I've said, were distinct types of text in Scotland. And the inclusion of genealogy and panegyric in the copper plates of Bengal has no parallel among medieval Scottish or European documents in general. Was there potential, however, for genealogies to perform functions still uh, similar to charters and panegyric? we've asked. And these are new questions which arise directly out of our comparison with the Bengal copper plates. This has the potential to offer a fresh perspective 
on material that's familiar to historians of the medieval Gaelic world. Now, in the genealogy of the King of Scots, read out at the inauguration of each king, there are a few names where the interpretation depends on the assumption that there was a panegyric intention. So if we go on to the next slide. So a possible translation of the, this section of the Scottish royal genealogy uh, is as you can see. So Ochilf uh, Munrama is son of true Ingus, son of dreams Fiddlevith, son of beautiful Ingus, son of long hair Fiddlevith, son of ancient Cormac, son of effective wealth, son of handsome top, son of fierce teeth, son of echo glorious upper arm, son of fiercher battle prince. Many of these epithets and invented names can readily be recognized as referring to kingly attributes, truth, battle-worthiness, wealth, beauty, and striking physical appearance. It's possible, therefore, to find ways of reading these names, albeit a little awkwardly in some cases, as highlighting physical and personal qualities that could, when recited, have served as a, a sort of contracted and concise form of panegyric to the king whose genealogy this was. It could have been rewritten to enhance the impact of the genealogy as a statement of kingship specifically with the royal inauguration in mind. Now, if we move on, so we move back to um, the Rajipur copper plate, and if we go on again, so in this copper plate, you can see uh, I've broken it down into various sections. We begin with the Prashasti, the place where um, the edict was uh, made, it, it is named. Uh, Gopala Dev, a uh, devout Buddhist, announces to all the gathered royal officials that a village has been given to a Brahmana. And part of that gift is the fine of ten offenses, the right to that, the right to catch thieves, uh, all royal income from the land, exemption from all taxes. The gift is made in the name of the Buddha forever for increased merit and fame of king and his parents. The donation should be approved and protected by the witnesses and future kings. Religious sanction against infringement is given. And then it is dated by regnal year and the date of the month. Then we have the name of the scribe or engraver. And finally, there is the seal, which is uh, the inscription is seal of the illustrious Gopala Dev, success on homage to the Buddha, welfare. Right, if we go on to this next charter, the earliest Scottish charter and, uh, of, um, by King Duncan II, if we move on again. So here, Duncan, this is as close as we get to the, the genealogical element in, 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 in the copper plates. Uh, Duncan, who uh, emphasizes his right to rule by describing as himself as um, und undoubted King of Scotland by inheritance, son of King Malcolm, undoubted King of Scotland by inheritance. Uh, he's given to St. Cuthbert and to his servants, that means the monastery of St. Cuthbert at Durham, uh, and he's given multiple villages. The gift is free of all service and tax due to the king. The gift comes with legal jurisdiction over the lands given. The gift is made for the king himself and for the souls of his father, brothers, wife, and children. So here's a spiritual benefit. The gift has been consented to by the king's heirs, which so he's looking to the future so that the future kings will confirm and uphold the grant. And there's a religious sanction against infringement, 
and the scribe names himself. Finally, there's the seal, seal of Duncan, by God's rule, King of the Scots. We move on again. So here you can see um, uh, in, in, in black type all the points of uh, almost exact similarity, and in red, the uh, bits where we don't quite overlap. So in this particular case, uh, obviously there's no prashasti. The place where the act was given isn't named. Um, there's no address um, to, to the royal officials, and there's no date. But if we go on again, in this charter, um, uh, about 100 years later, um, this is William the Lion. If we move on again, we do in fact find that the place of the act is named, and here it's Forfa. And then we have a list of the royal, well, the, mag, the, the ecclesiastical uh, prelates, the um, bishops, abbots, then the magnates, who are the earls and barons, and then the royal um, officers, the justices, the sheriffs, the provosts of the royal boroughs, the officials, and then all the law-worthy men, the people, the free men, who are, uh, have the status of um, being able to uh, stand as witnesses in court. So here we have these elements that we find uh, in, in the copper plates. And if you move on one, one more time, I think here's another. This is uh, Alexander II, uh, another charter. If we move on once more, and here's another fascinating parallel, the way that the date is expressed. And just as in that copper plate I showed you a minute ago, the date is done by the year of the king's reign and the date of the month. I think we can move on one more now. And again, right. Right, we'll come to this in a minute. Right. Now, another theme of interest in the Bengal material appears to be the extent to which the Brahmanas were increasingly, increasingly the recipients of land as donations. And our collaborator, Dr. Shantini Pal, has argued that after the ninth century, the Brahmanas were uh, exclusively the recipients of gifts of land by the ruling authority. And boundary clauses reveal that the lands the Brahmanas were given would often be bounded by lands of non-Brahmanas. In Scotland, by comparison, interaction between the church and lay people may have been one factor which fueled the writing of charters in the 12th century. A further parallel is the increasing detail given in charters across time. And Shushandra Ghosh has demonstrated this in the boundary clauses of Karma Rupa charters from the 6th to 12th centuries. As different ruling dynasties came to the fore in this era, area, descriptions of boundaries in copper plate inscriptions began to become more complex and detailed. This general pattern is mirrored to some extent in 12th and 13th century Scottish charters, where the language and some aspects of the transaction were becoming more detailed over time. Um, if you move on one more, um, as well as increasingly standardized in their form. But an interesting contrast between the two bodies of material, that from Bengal and that from Scotland, is in the nature of the donors. Um, so, Shantani Pal has argued that kings exclusively emerged as donors in all sub-regions, and that this tradition continued throughout the rest of the period. But in Scotland, the donors were taking the opposite course. From the 12th century onwards, the types of donor were diversifying as the use of charters was being adopted by a widening range of landholders beyond the kings themselves. And here um, is an example on the left of, of a lay person making quite a major donation. 
And this reminds us that we should, and then this is the boundary clause, of course, and this reminds us that we should keep in the foreground of our analysis the users as much as the uses of the written word. Now, I just want to um, go back slightly, if you move on one more time, to back to the uh, back to the inauguration of the Kings of Scots to, to, to finish off. The inclusion of genealogy and panegyric in the copper plates of Bengal, as I've already mentioned, has no parallel among medieval Scottish or European documents. But in the case of the genealogy of the King of Scots, this panegyric dimension, as I've said already, was introduced into the genealogy by the year 1005. And as a piece of parchment, read out, so technically a charter, because literally a charter is a piece of parchment. As a piece of parchment read out when lawful possession of the kingdom had been established by any king, the official genealogy also had some similarities with a charter. And the chief significance of the genealogy in the inauguration of a king of the Scots was to highlight the pivotal role of traditional literate learning in authenticating the king and his kingship, a role enhanced by the panegyric element as well as by reading from a scroll. In general terms, it was the special function of the learned orders to legitimize the social order. In Scotland, this source of authority was associated particularly with the King of Scots, perhaps from as early as the 10th century, and the same may have been true of other major kings in lands where the Gallic language was spoken. And returning to the point that there's a contrast between kings becoming exclusively the donors of land in the Bengal copper plates on the one hand, and on the other hand, the widening range of donors in the 12th and 13th, in 12th and 13th century Scotland. It's possible that the intensifying link between kingship and traditional literate learning suggested by reading out the royal genealogy from a scroll at the king's inauguration has similarities with the intimate ties between brahmanas and kings that were immortalized in stone and copper plate inscriptions from ancient and early medieval Bengal. Perhaps, therefore, it's the genealogy of the king of Scots rather than the, the charters themselves that offer the closest parallel with the Bengal copper plates in terms of the relationship between special, specialist practitioners and the social authority which they represented, a relationship in which distinctions between genealogy, panegyric, and charter could become less significant as ways of reinforcing the exercise of royal authority in particular contexts. Finally, let's consider one further concept arising from these studies. In both contexts, we may view the centrality of the ruler's legitimacy to his position as the supreme authenticating authority, the fount of justice and landholding. In the period when there was no king of Scots, in the last decade of the 13th century, and Scotland was ruled by a group of guardians, no gifts of perpetuities were issued. There were no gifts of land made. Similarly, in England in the late 13th century, Edward I succeeded to the English throne while on crusade. No perpetuities were issued until he had returned to England and been crowned as the legitimate king. Meanwhile, in Bengal, the Prashasti legitimized the royal donor and guaranteed a gift forever. In Scotland, the genealogy read out at the inauguration might have acted in a similar way, guaranteeing all donations made in perpetuity by the king or confirmed by the king. Now, a decade before Sir William Jones and his wife arrived in Calcutta, 
on the other side of the world and in another British colony, Thomas Jefferson was writing a draft of the American Declaration of Independence. Among the self-evident truths that Jefferson enumerated were the unalienable right to life, liberty, and property. But as I'm sure we all know, in the final version of the Declaration of Independence, property was changed to the pursuit of happiness. But the earlier wording perhaps shows more clearly how the issues at stake in uh, America in 1776 were those fundamental questions of human civilization and the person. Who rules us? And what rights do they have over our persons and property? And these are the fundamental and perennial questions that in the end are at the heart of our collaborative comparative study. In both cases, we've been aiming to understand the rights and powers a ruler had over a subject's lands and how possession of land related to administration of the law and the development of government. And in addressing these questions of who rules and what rights they have over property, we can come for now to perhaps at least, at least three key conclusions, and three is always a good number for conclusions. In both societies, first of all, property could be owned outright forever by persons and groups of people other than a king. In two early medieval societies, 6,000 miles apart, and with no known contemporary connections or influences, there evolved an almost exactly similar conceptual and textual framework to record and guarantee the conveyance and ownership of property. And in each context, the king was the supreme authenticating authority, fount of justice and property holding, but it was only as the legitimate heir of his ancestors, proved by the publication in copper, parchment or stone of his genealogy, that he could govern and guarantee the rights of his subjects. There's evidently a meeting of interests of scholars working on medieval Bengal and Scotland in what written records of property transfer can offer the study of medieval societies. After these essential preliminary steps, establishing the nature of these records not only as text, but as physical artifacts, whether parchment, copper, or stone, I hope more fruitful work can be pursued in the future. And our book of collected studies called Copper, Parchment and Stone will be published later this autumn and I plan to come back to Calcutta after that for an official launch together with uh, Professor Shwapna Bhattacharya and my other friends in this wonderful city. Dhanabad.